please welcome Ismail Kola. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks, Patrick, for a great meeting and for the invitation. So you heard from Annabelle um, the problems that relate to drug discovery. And many of you would have heard that many of the major pharmaceutical companies are pulling out of neuroscience research. Unlike many of the other companies, UCB has decided to make neuroscience research one of our two major platforms so that we can bring these innovative medicines to patients following in the footsteps of the breakthrough medicines that we've done previously, like Capra for epilepsy, Vimpet for epilepsy, uh, and our anti-Parkinson's drugs. But then the question becomes, and I'm going to formulate the problem statement, and then how are we going to be successful? Why do we have reason to believe that, in fact, we should still make these medicines that are very effective for patients? Is the, is the mic on? Good, no. good. Yeah. Okay, so I start off with uh, what pharma people normally show at these meetings, which is a disclaimer, which means I'm going to make some forward-looking statements, so don't, please don't trade in UCB stock based on my talk today. Now, the first graph I'm showing you is a, a paper that I published with my colleague John Landis in Nature Review's Drug Discovery in 2004. And for the first time, we drew attention on the attrition problem in the pharmaceutical industry. Essentially, what we were saying is that the pharmaceutical industry is effective. Many of you have been impacted by the medicines we've made. Life expectancy has increased in the Western world. From the turn of the century, if you're a white male in the United States of America, you had a life expectancy of about 45. Today, your life expectancy is about 78. And 50% of this is attributable to pharmaceutical intervention. But we're not efficient. And what the first graph shows is forget all of drug discovery that you heard early on, all the preclinical stuff and all the genetics and all the kind of test tube stuff. But if you go first in man, you, you, you put the molecule into man, and you see whether the molecule comes out as a medicine the other end. In 2004, only one in 11 molecules made it. Put the other way, 89, sorry, one in, yeah, one in 11. 89% of molecules failed in drug development. Okay, so remember that statistic. And then the next graph, and that paper there has been cited some 1,500 times now. It's the third most cited paper in Nature Review's drug discovery. And I'm puzzled why, because to me, the attrition problem was so great that people are only latching onto it now. So what's happening since then? The next graph shows data, and, and, and that first graph that we based our study on was 10 pharmaceutical companies, the 10 biggest pharmaceutical companies industry-wide over one decade. The next figure is data from KMR, which shows that, in fact, in the last five years, the success rates of drug development has actually halved. So instead of 1 in 11 coming through, it's now like 1 in 20. And the Tufts School of Medicine has worked out that the fully loaded cost to bring a medicine to the market now is $2.5 billion to bring a fully loaded uh, medicine um, to the market. Now, what we also showed, and this, the first graph comes from our paper, is again, in the entire, from first in man, so first from phase one right through to end, what the different therapeutic areas look like. And you can see that the CNS and oncology were the areas that had the lowest success rate in drug development. So instead of it being one in 11, in neurosciences, it was like one in 20 in this 2004 period already. Okay, so that's bad enough. Not only is drug, drug development very inefficient, but neuroscience drug development is particularly inefficient. What the next graph shows is, again, industry-wide data as to why things fail in phase three. So it's no more the entire drug development process. Now, you've done all your preclinical science, you've done your phase one, you've done your phase two, You've gone into 500 patients, you've got a signal, and you decide to bat on this molecule. And in neuroscience, it shows that 
67% of molecules that enter phase three, which means two out of three, fail. And the major reason they fail is because they don't, they're not efficacious enough, lack of efficacy. So think about this. You've done all of that research, you've done those trials in man, and you're actually not even better than a flip of a coin. Right? So the question is, why should we believe and how do we make the return on investment, both for patients and for our shareholders, make this a viable proposition? And what I'm going to share with you is the approach we're using at UCB. Now, I have to say one other thing before that, is that in the last five years, we've actually increased the pipeline very dramatically. In fact, it's been described by many banks as the, 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 the industry uh, for the size of the company, the best uh, pipeline in the industry, both early, mid, and late stage. Um, but we've placed a bet on first-in-class molecules, which even have a high attrition rate. So we are not going to go for molecules that others have made medicines against. We're going to go for novel targets. And so why would we expect not to fail more frequently, given the problem that I laid out to you? The first thing is better validated genetic targets. And you heard a little bit about that, but we actually have a, a nuanced but important difference from what you just heard from the previous speaker. Now, we have a medicine in phase three for osteoporosis, which we published in the New England Journal of Medicine in, uh, on 1st January 2014, together with Amgen, that's UCB and Amgen, an antibody called sclerostin that actually increased bone mineral density more than twofold greater than any other medicine that's on the market at the moment. And the way that medicine came about is we, our scientists, identified the gene, the antisclerostin gene, and then made the antibody to target that gene. And that was done in a South African Afrikaner population who had a disease called Van Buchem's disease or sclerostosis, where they actually grew normal, healthy bone even though they had none of this gene product. So in essence to us, the lesson that came out of that study is let nature, let's use the experiments nature has done in man, the genetic experiments. And the computation that eight billion people on Earth, each person having 20 to 40 new mutations that your parents didn't have will mean that nature would have knocked out every single gene out of the 23 and a half thousand genes at least once, and those who didn't die as embryos or fetuses or in early development would come to term. But the reason you don't see many of these genetic abnormalities in your children is because the 20 and 40 errors you have out of the 23 and a half thousand genes are different from the 20 or 40 errors that your partner has because the statistical probability that they will be in the same genes is very rare. With one important exception, the 1.6 billion Muslim Islamic people on earth who actually have consanguous marriage amongst the vast majority of the population. So people marry their cousins who marry their cousins who marry their cousins, and so the statistical probability that you will see these rare phenotypes in these populations uh, come to terms. So the first thing I'll show you some data on that. We have a very strict translational medicine paradigm where we interrogate questions. Have we got the right target? Have we got the right molecule? Have we got the right patient population? Have we got the right indication? And we use novel modalities like imaging, etc., to de-risk molecules as we go forward. So it's right target, right molecule, right indication, right patient. And that's the way we increase the probability of success. So here's some data published from our scientists. The first one in Nature Communication recently from Rafael Kaminsky, who head our ap epilepsy research, where they looked at epileptic population to find genes, and they find this gene Cestin-3. We have, with David Goldstein at Duke University, a population, an entire population, where we're doing whole genome sequencing. As you heard, now we can sequence your genome in a few days at less than $1,500, so the power of genome sequencing can really be unleashed. And we've just uh, written, I wrote with John Bell from Oxford, a call to, to do the subpopulation, uh, to redo the taxonomy of human disease, 
so we can focus on specific populations. And Duncan McHale, who's my head of global exploratory development, is leading a project at the Innovative Medicines Initiative to actually redo the taxonomy of some of the neuroscience diseases. So use of genetics is very, very uh, deeply entrenched in, in, in our work product. This is particularly interesting. We are partnering with Weill Cornell Medical School to study the Qatari population. And the 300,000 indigenous Qataris, actually on the top diagram, Q1, Q2, Q3, from the studies that Ron Crystal has done at Weill Cornell already, show some interesting data. About 50% of the Qataris are derived from Bedouin Arabs, about 25 or 30 percent from Persian traders, and about 10 percent from Africans on the Horn of Africa. And if you look at that first graph, you see that they actually segregate to the three vertices of the triangle because there's very little admixture. These different populations don't marry across into the other populations. They actually stick into their own and actually marry first cousins and marry first cousins. And then the next graph shows in orange the Qatari population, and shows homozygosity, which is the two genes that you have. How homozygous are they? The Qataris have the highest homozygosity rate in the world. So in fact, by studying these populations and looking at rare genetic disorders there and doing entire sequencing is a very powerful tool for us. And unless, unlike Arneville, we don't believe that GWAS studies are going to provide a lot of information. They're just too abundant. They, they rough association. We are focusing on rare, rare variants that have very, very high signals, occur much infrequently, but actually will point you to the disease-causing pathways, etc. The next thing is we think of drug development as two phases. Phase one and phase two, the learn phase, where we go into man, we do the experiments, and we interrogate the data, and then when we go into phase three, we're in the confirm phase. And in the ideal state, we should have no failure in the confirm phase. And so how do we do that? Once we approve the candidate, we ask the question in man, is the molecule, whether it's an antibody or a small molecule, good enough? to do what it did in animal studies so that if we get a negative result, we know whether we failed, the molecule has failed, or has the mechanism failed. So we don't sit and guess. We know whether we need to go back and fix the molecule and make a better molecule, or have we got the wrong target? Should we be going for the wrong, right target? From several papers I wrote, the next point we use is POC. And in pharmaceutical industry speak, POC stands for proof of concept in man. In this context, I propose that we, that we use the term called POC light, which is in small numbers of patients, we look for a big signal to show that the medicine is working, and I call that pull out the checkbook, because it's for people like me who sit on there to make an investment decision on which molecule to bet on versus just going in blindly and having a Hail Mary pass. And then at the end of phase two, which is proof of concept in man, we need to modulate the registrable endpoints that the regulators will use, whether they approve or disapprove your medicine. I should also say that the uh, statistics I showed you are statistics on what I call regulatory success. So those abysmal statistics are, uh, are on regulatory success. There's another element that's come in with payer pressure, which is called commercial success. Even in the 90s, only three out of 10 medicines approved by the regulators ever brought back the investment made in them. That exponential, that investment has in increased exponentially, and in fact our estimates now are one in 20 molecules are only bringing back the investment. So this whole thing of regulatory and commercial success is very important, and during development, we see whether we've really got a differentiated medicine that brings value to patients. So this development paradigm is very critical for us. I'm not going to go into detail, but to show you that like others, the modalities brought by imaging are helping us uh, where we're using either to look at biomarkers or, in fact, to see how well our molecules occupy the target. We call this target engagement in the brain. And here's some data just to show with Lavaracetam, which is UCB's uh, the, the, most, the best selling medicine, Capra. 
Here we, we looked at Leveracetam and Brivaracetam, which has just finished phase three and is now being filed uh, for, for, for approval. If we do this, if we sit down and use the two levers, which is proof of, proof of concept in men, so get to phase 2b, where we've modulated the registrable endpoint, and we do trials where we have objective and robust biomarkers, we land up in the top quadrant where we, in fact, have only 25% failure in phase 3 as compared to the industry-wide, which I showed you for CNS, is something like 67% failure. So a threefold improvement in productivity. And these are some metrics that we have now from our new medicines at UCB in the last five and a half years in blue are the industry ones. To get half a medicine out industry-wide, you need to have 13.9 molecules start development. So something like 28 molecules to make one medicine. And the timelines are shown there. With this what, that we've put into place, we are now running on a number of small, smaller number though, that for every one molecule we want out, we only need to start with eight, given that we work on better quality targets, have better translational profiles, etc., and we actually bring the medicines to market at least uh, a year and a half to two earlier. So with that, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions when the panel meets and, and, and hope that I've stimulated some thoughts. Thank you.